So it's possible potentially to help someone spark their passion, but not necessarily teach it, to clear pathways for them, to express it, exactly. but not teach them because it's inherent it's within right. them, right. is a wonderful way to look at it. And that might be how ego is a tool, right? Mm. Mm. Because if it's already in there, and you're not worried about getting credit, then you know you have a healthy sense of self, right? which is that healthy sense of ego. Like, I know who I am. I don't need your approval. Mm. I don't need mm. you to validate me. So if you do or if you don't, it's okay. I'm fine with that. But I know who I am and I know what I desire to do in this world. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna keep moving toward that because there's this passion that drives me. That's, that, okay, so thank you for clarifying that. Now I understand how, where you can use it as a tool. Yeah, and in what I've heard from you, it does seem like that's where it comes from for you, where there's just like this internal fire that takes you forward to be a voice for women, to be a voice for children, to help individuals who have not had the opportunity to necessarily, they would speak for themselves if they could, mm -hmm. they've just not been given the opportunity. And so if we can go back to when you returned to Afghanistan, mm -hmm. when you returned there, what, what was your journey? What did you say, okay, I'm gonna return and this is what I'm gonna do? Or did you just go back knowing I'll find something to do? I was young, okay. <laughs> <laughs> much younger than today, of course. Um, I had the honor and the privilege of being raised in a family where uh, my parents kept alive Afghanistan and its value system and our identity, the way they understood it, the way that they had um, lived it. and. Um, in a beautiful, natural way, they kind of injected that identity to us, even though living in America. So I'll clearly ex explain how. Um, when we first arrived and then settled into our new home uh, and started school, my father made a simple rule. When you come inside the house, you don't speak in English to each other. Um, and he said, I know that English is a relatively easier language to learn and you will learn. Um, but you, I don't want you guys to forget your mother's tongue, which is Pashto. And so we knew ch as children, even as young as 11, 12 years old, when uh, we had arrived in my, we had little brothers who were uh, in their toddler age, we were forced to speak Pashto at home. And at that time, you know, as kids, you kind of, want to rebel against it but I'm so thankful to that rule because that enabled me to retain my language which helped me tremendously when I returned back in 2003. Um, the general practice of food of course culture travels through its food through its traditions and customs of marriages and ceremonies and births and deaths so those are things that even though we were living in America we had kept those traditions intact to the best of our abilities. And so when I went back, I, I went back with the stories of my parents, the stories and the, 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 the emotions uh, that they'd shared with me growing up that this is what Afghans are like, you know, that history, that identity. So I felt going back, for me, it was almost this natural, like, I'm not going to anything that I don't know. You know, for me, it was just going to a home that was many thousand miles away. After two months of being in Afghanistan, I realized I had this awakening almost. I said, I thought I was Afghan, but I have become Americanized. And I didn't know it until being on the ground for about two months after. And the realization was not so much the physical outer appearance because I dressed like an Afghan, you know, traditional clothing. I covered my head, I prayed the prayers, I spoke the language, I ate the food. So not American in that sense, because I fit right in. But American in the sense of thinking. My thinking had changed. 
And this ability through the education system that I had received here in America, um, and I'm not saying that this is predominantly and only available in America, because my father was a product of older generations in Afghanistan who had been educated in Afghanistan, and he was very much an open thinker and a very, you know, open-minded person. So I know that the education system during my father's upbringing time frame was much different than what the past, say, four, four and a half decades have done to us as a nation and as a people. And so I realized quickly that I thought and I processed information very differently than my Afghan friends, family, and colleagues that I was on the ground with. And But uh, while it was an eye-awakening experience for me to know and be comfortable with the fact that I am dual, I'm a dual citizen, really, in the true sense of the word. I'm Afghan because I can relate, I have history, I have identity, I have my roots. And, and, and Afghanistan having those lineages, the, the roots to people who are known is an incredibly important element. And luckily I'm blessed with that, so I have that. But at the same time, I felt very much American. And so I think after having that realization, I realized that I'm a natural bridge between these two cultures. As I was trying to not battle, but teach my friends, my neighbors, my classmates, my colleagues about my culture and my identity as an Afghan citizen here in America, I realized that I began, I started to do the opposite to my Afghan men and women that I was working with that no, America is not what you, you know, the stereotypical image that is painted in the hearts and minds of people that no, America is not like that. Americans are not like that. So it was, it was very interesting to see that dichotomy at play. And while at the same time realizing that even the physical outer appearance that I tried not to pay too much attention to, I realized going back to Afghanistan that while covering my head, the way I'm clothed and the way I dress, while it's too much for America, going like this to Afghanistan, it was too little for Afghanistan. So not, you know, not, not completely uh, adapting to the whole separate life of women and wearing the burqa and trying to live a life away from the men in the society, the public men. Uh, that in itself proved me to the Afghan community that I was not Afghan enough because I was completely comfortable with sitting with men and talking with men and working with men. And so there's always this, this dual, and now that I'm back, I'm replaying that, um, the, the clothes I wear, the languages that I speak, the, the experience that I have and the, from the experience and the people and the, the mindsets that I've learned about, just communicating that. Um, unfortunately, there is this perception in America that particularly as the Taliban took over, some of the political narratives revolved around this idea of, Afghans want elements like the Taliban. The great majority of Afghans don't want development. They don't like democracy. They don't want women's empowerment. And so if they want the Taliban, give it to them. But I know, yes, we might look like very, you know, people still living a couple centuries back from our dress code, from our attire, from our the way we live our lives. But it's we're, as Afghan people, we're not close-minded to the point where we want extremist regimes like the Taliban to come in and, and rule the nation. It was complete politics at play. Politics supported by guns with bullets that literally killed people. And when you have a bullet you know, pointed at your head, whether you agree or not agree, you're gonna have your head. For the fear of being saved and so when we use you know such rhetoric to say that people want extremist ideologies like the taliban to come and rule them i tell my american friends i tell my colleagues that it's, it's not as easy 
and don't be as naive to think that that's what the majority wants. So just being that bridge, trying to understand both cultures and trying to be an advocate for both cultures uh, simultaneously has been both an incredible uh, journey, but also one that is painful because you're constantly trying to to go against what the perceptions are. And I'm sure you understand how difficult it is to fight against perceptions. Yes. And to know where you fit then, because if you're part of both, but not fully either, yeah. there's a personal sacrifice oh, absolutely. that occurs there. Don't even talk about sacrifices. Yeah. And I don't know that, again, that's where ego comes into play mm -hmm. because we're all so set on no, my way is the way. But there is no single way. And you being that middle in all that you have sacrificed in the name of there is no one way. And I wish people would understand. <laughs>